Sean Franklin from Blood and Iron Martial Arts here with special guest Kyle Griswold from the Phoenix Society of Historical Swordsmanship. You're here today to talk to you about I-33. You mean 133, Sean? I don't know. What's the correct one? It's going to be 133. So as I teach 133 in my school, before we even grab either the shield or the sword, we're going to talk about how to just hold ourselves the correct basic postures. The first thing we're going to talk about is keeping the back aligned and straight. One of the things that people are always going to often do in 133, because it's an easy habit, is because they want to suck everything in, they're going to break their posture and they're going to bend forward here, which really kind of creates this hunch in the back. I'm always going to keep my back nice and straight no matter where I'm at. I'm going to lean forward at the hips just slightly and I should basically always be having my hips squared up when I can against my opponent so that both hands are the same distance. That allows me to utilize both weapons whenever I have the opportunity to do so. Anytime I'm stepping, I'm really going to be trying to have this sort of pushing against my opponent. And so as we step, we keep our arms slightly bent without completely locking the elbow, just a slight bend in the elbow. And we'll practice moving while keeping our back straight and this forward posture. We can do that over and over again. And basically all we're gonna do with that is just try and focus on keeping the hands the same length, not breaking one elbow and having one past the other, and then keeping the structure in the back as we move. So moving into actually how we're gonna hold the shield and the sword, there's seven common wards in 133, and I'm going to discuss them very quickly. The first ward is gonna be underarm, or the first ward. Basically right foot forward, the sword will be held under the arm with the buckler extended or the buckler can be drawn in. Again, the sword is going to be held under the arm with the knuckles high, okay? Second ward can be performed with either foot forward. The buckler is extended. The sword is held in a chambered position on the right shoulder. Again, there's some people who want to have a specifically very horizontal here, but really as this is a common ward, anything in here that's chambered for a right position is gonna be fine. Step forward, we go to our third, our, to our left shoulder. From the left shoulder, we have third ward. Again, this is another position from which we can deliver strikes from the other side. Bringing the buckler in and the sword behind the back, we are in fourth ward. From fourth ward, we can throw strikes from multiple directions and the buckler can be met forward in order to deliver the strike. Fifth ward is gonna be our long tail. Sword's gonna be brought back with the buckler extended. This is a position from which we can thrust from. Sixth ward is gonna be from the breast. The sword is gonna be held horizontally across the chest with a point threatening, but not allowing our, our opponent the ability to manipulate our blade. And seventh ward is the ward from which all the art flows, according to the manual, which is our seventh ward. It's our basically our long point. There's three variations. We can have a low long point, a traditional long point, and then a high seventh. So having understood the way that the guards work, and they, they basically function the way that all the wards work and any of the postures work from other fighting systems. What makes 133, one of the things that makes 133 different is that we have these things called obsessios or besiegements or displacements, which actually act as counters against the guards. So one of the, so some of the common ones we'll have, well, probably the most common one is gonna be half shield. Basically, the point is gonna be held up high, the buckler extended. Some people will have the point much lower, but this really isn't quite correct. The point should be held high, and what from this position, the manual says that if Sean here is in first ward, he attacking my head is gonna be very difficult, as it's very easy for me to counter. And it says that if he tries to strike below my buckler, it's very pernicious to his head. So 
Half shield allows us to do, half shield is an example of a displacement which allows us to enter and counter certain wards. I'll give another example. So if Sean goes back into first ward, I could end cover measure while going into a cover. And that basically puts Sean in a bad position because he now has to deal with the fact that I've closed off perhaps one of the lines that he wanted to deal with. So now as I close measure, I come in, I cover the lines of attack that he may want to give. And if he does nothing at all, if he simply freezes because he's identified that I've covered the line he doesn't want, now I've set up myself for an attack. Um, this is kind of consistent throughout everything. Just one more example of this. If Sean is fighting from his second ward position, I may go and again, go to scoot center cover. I could enter from a second position, come over with my hand over, and now I've basically denied him the line of attack that he's most likely to engage me from. But if he does nothing from here, the manual simply says that I can attack him freely. So now that I have an understanding of what the wards do and what the covers do, the displacements as we work against one another, let's talk about what fundamentally 133 is attempting to achieve. 133 is attempting to control the opponent's weapons, both of them, while before actually attacking the opponent. If our opponents make certain mistakes, we may be able to find ourselves in a position to attack them without having to manipulate both weapons. But for the most part, we're assuming that our opponent is a competent fencer. And in order to safely attack him, we need to control his weapons. The very first thing and simplest concept that we'll discuss is gonna be the overbind and underbind. Sean and I extend our swords from this position right here with our swords both being on the line, neither of us have any advantage over the other. As soon as I go to push Sean's sword off to the side, he is now overbound and he, is, he has the underbind and I have the overbind and he is at a position of disadvantage. If Sean pushes me over to the other side, I am now overbound and he has the overbind. From this position, I have to perform what's called a mutation of the sword in order to now regain the dominant position. The manual doesn't specifically tell us how to do this, but we can infer certain things based off of later manuals, such as I might perform a cavazioni, or simply dipping under the sword and replacing his dominant position. The other way I may change this is by simply changing my line, and now by stepping on and changing the line, I have gained the dominant position. And the third way that we may be able to achieve this is he has a stronger portion of his sword on mine, and now I simply push my strong into, onto his weak, and now I again have mutated the sword. So throughout the process of the fencing, I want to try to seek the overbind. I want to have my sword in the dominant position. But for those of you who have practiced rapier fencing, you'll understand that this concept of gain the blade is very simple and it makes a lot of sense. Once I have achieve the overbind, the next simplest technique that I want to perform is gonna be the shield knock. The shield knock is simply a strike which allows me to control both weapons, and this is gonna be very important. After I have overbind, I can come in, hit his weapons, I have his weapons controlled, and now he is free to be attacked, and he has no way for him to retaliate. From the other side, the bind would look something like this. I have my opponent overbound. I enter, knocking both weapons aside. And in this case, he hasn't covered his hand. This could be a potentially crippling strike to the hand. And again, I enter with a strike. So having controlled both weapons, I go in, I enter, and I commit a strike. Another option I have in order to attack my opponent from a safe position is the tread through. If for example, Sean is in his second ward position and he's chambered to cut me, I can go and cover perhaps from half shield or cover against his attack, his descending over how attack. I've come, I've committed to stopping this blow with my sword. 
And from this position, he can no longer defend me with his sword, and I can simply go with a passing step and a strike. I can simply come in to his head and strike here. And at this point, he has a very difficult time trying to counter me or defend against the attack. The tread through appears in other positions, and now we'll go and talk about how to get out of, uh, of the, if we are overbound, how to escape the overbind. There's three different ways in which, in the very first play, we, have a, we talk about how to get out of the, a vulnerable position if we have find ourselves overbound. So perhaps this time he's bound me and he's a little closer to me than he was before. He comes in to shield knock me. I step through him, shield knock his weapons before he can shield knock mine, and then I deliver the strike to the neck. The third option is the grapple, which isn't necessarily depicted with an illustration in this first play. But let's say, for example, he has bound me, and he has bound me very, very closely. And before he has begun to initiate his shield strike, I know that I have to cover my head because from this position, all he has to simply do is raise his sword up to my neck and I'm going to die. So as I have realized that he has bound me and he's in a very dominant position, I simply keep this pressure up against him to, to, to prevent him from committing, committing an attack. I roll my elbow over, I envelop both of his arms, and now I'm in a good position. All right, Kyle, thank you very much for teaching us all about 133 Soren Buckler. We're very glad to have you. It was a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, obviously, we didn't go through everything in 133. There's a lot to this manual and a lot to this source um, that I couldn't have described in the short video, but I really felt like I provided with a lot of the basics of the, of the, and the basic concepts of the source that gives the viewer sort of an idea of what it's all about. So, yeah, well, we're very grateful and I hope you have all enjoyed this.